The astoundingly popular YouTube sensation, The Genre Guys, starring Hangry Table, Lauren Connor, and Lou Wasserman's Ghost, has taken audiences by storm with their invaluable commentary on movies throughout the past century. Previously, their content was exclusive to members on the WDW Pro channel, but now that door is opening for you, whether you're a longtime member or are visiting our channels for the very first time. Without any further ado, and for the first time ever, the public debut of the genre guys covering 1956's Forbidden Planet. <laughs> All right, members of the channel, welcome back to more member-exclusive content. It's the Genre Guys, and based on the feedback, you all love this, and we love bringing you this series. I am so excited. Tommy, what are we discussing uh, today? We are discussing early sci-fi, and by early, I mean, gosh, uh, probably, you know, before a lot of the listeners were even alive. Um, Sisters to Star Wars and that kind of thing? <laughs> Oh, the, the 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 inspiration for Star Trek, the inspiration for Star Wars, for all of those things, and um, the film that we have sort of settled on to begin this discussion is Forbidden Planet, which stars a very dashing Leslie Nielsen. Ooh. Before they found out he was funny. Yeah, basically, <laughs> exactly. Well, I will hop off, and uh, maybe in the future we'll cover uh, Spy Hard and the Naked Gun and all that. But for now. Gentlemen, take it away. Well, thank you, Pro. Hello, Lauren. Hello, Lou. How are you guys doing today? Ready to blast off. Yep, looking forward to it. Yeah, so this episode of The Genre Guys, number one, to the audience who are listening, thank you so much for your feedback. Uh, it's, been, it's been really exciting to see how excited you guys have been for these types of discussions. We've been very, very grateful for the, fee like, for the comments that you've left, the feedback. Um, and as long as you keep wanting to listen to them, we're happy to keep doing them. So this today's uh, subject was inspired by a comment about how uh, one of the audience members wanted to see more discussion on older sci-fi, sort of like the, the original stuff, like the things that, well, basically, you know, sci-fi before there was really sci-fi. And so after a little conversation that between... Lauren, Lou, and myself, we thought, hey, you know what? I think we thought that maybe Forbidden Planet was the way to sort of kick things off on this. Guys, what do you and, think? Did you have a chance to watch? Oh, sure. And, and we should mention it, was, it came out in 1956 uh, from MGM, and there's a story about that. The last MGM science fiction movie before that was Mysterious Island in 1929. So that was quite a long gap in between. And for those who are interested in science fiction, it is universally acknowledged, or pretty universally, that the first science fiction ever written, believe it or not, was Frankenstein. Yep. So the worlds of monsters and science blend in interesting ways. And they all, in some way, have to do with, do we dare use this technology when humanity hasn't quite grown up enough to figure it out? Which is certainly the case in this movie. Very yeah, true. actually, I was uh, commenting on a Twitter th thread earlier today where somebody was asking, what is it with the fascination of concepts like the Terminator? Why is it that people gravitate to this? And one of the commentators on there, I agreed with, he said it, it has to do with man's potential for his own destruction. And I, I think it's more than that. The theme is man's hubris in thinking that they can play with something dangerous and that it is worthwhile to do so thinking that they can uh, correct for any unforeseen or unknown consequences and learning to their chagrin that they can't. Yeah, the Absolutely. basic irony being we're going to create, for example, a supercomputer that's 50 million times smarter than we are, but we're smart enough to control it. Oh, yeah, that's going to work really well. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa, Alexa, you're not listening to this, are you, Alexa? <laughs> So why don't we why don't we kick off with a a quick little introduction to the Forbidden Planet movie and and what it's basically about? Um, you know, when I I'm going to preface this by saying that the it's a it's a drama set in space. It is set on the planet of Altair Four, and it features an intrepid crew in a saucer shaped craft um, landing on a strange, desolate planet 
which contains only a scientist by the name of Morbius, and no, not Jared Leto, uh, and his uh, nubile daughter, uh, Altair. Al- Altera? Alta? Alta, I think Altera, he yeah. Altera. Um, they were part of a previous colony expedition, and everyone else died for some reason. And so the, 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 the new crew of the intrepid ship... Um, I think the, the call sign was C-57D or something like that. I didn't yes. actually give it a name. C-57D is the name of the ship. Um, they've got to figure out what what's going on on this planet, which is becoming more and more foreboding or forbidden, I would say. I don't know. Lauren, Lou, do you guys want to pick it up from there? Well, the first interesting little piece of trivia, when they are coming out of light speed or warp speed and into regular speed, uh, they're timing it rather exactly because to protect their bodies from the shock of slowing down, they have to get under these things that look amazingly similar to the transporters on Star Trek. Oh, yeah. And what's interesting is the ship's clock tells them that the time at which they're going to make the shift out of light speed is 17 hours and 01 minutes. Now, if 1701 doesn't ring a bell, Gene Roddenberry loved this movie, and that's where NCC 1701 for the Enterprise came from. Well, you know, on... on but, you know, let, let's just quickly go through the rest of the story, um, okay. but I really want to touch on that because watching the film again, it you know I saw it as a kid, <clears throat> but seeing it again, it just blew me away how derivative Star Trek is of it, <laughs> basically. Anyway, so <clears throat> they land on this planet, some hijinks ensue, and it turns out that the planet held, hosted a long gone 2000 centuries species by the name of the Krell who left behind um, a whole bunch of mechanical wonders and um, this 2000 well, I, I believe it was a, was it a 2000 square foot cube of advanced technological machinery powered by uh, so many nuclear reactors it was equivalent to an exploding star 20 square miles miles okay yeah. yes all and, under the surface of this mostly desolate planet. Yeah, and okay. so and then so, Lauren, do you want to you want to continue on with the the summary? Well, I, I think it, it's important to preface this that that part isn't revealed until about the midpoint of the movie. Right. Um, one of the things that uh, we kind of brought up the Forbidden Planet a little bit when Stuttering Guitarist and I had the conversation about the black hole, and there's actually a lot of very similar plot points in this movie. I view them as kindred movies Yes. because you have, uh, instead of a, a ship that has gone missing, it's essentially a colony that's been out of contact for a long period of time. You have a ship that is following up to check up on them to see what's going on, and you have an inhabitant of the planet who is very interested in them not stopping off there. You you get immediately some vibes that this guy really doesn't want them there, and you're not quite sure why. He spins a story similar to Reinhardt in the Black Hole, as to how all of the colonists of the Bellerophon mission, which is the original ship that was there to colonize the planet, how all of the crew members, except for he and his wife, were killed, and yet he was somehow mysteriously immune to the depredations of whatever it was that killed him. He claims that they never saw anything, but that every one of the other crew members was ripped limb from limb. And... He has been alone there, supposedly. Initially, he says that he and his wife survived. He then says that his wife died of natural causes sometime after. And later it's revealed that he is hiding from the crew that is coming to check up on him a daughter. And so that's kind of the framing device. And when he reveals all of this information, naturally the crew, they've spent a year in transit to get to Altair 4 to find a colony that has no colonists, they now have to radio back to base to find out what do we do now. And that requires them to strip almost all of the vital components of their ship to build a transmitter that will allow them to transmit faster than light back to home base so that they don't have to travel all the way back to find out what are our new orders. And things kind of take off from there. And we might add that the daughter, when revealed, is the amazingly beautiful nubile Anne Francis. And obviously these red-blooded all-American astronauts are attracted <laughs> to her, and there's a certain amount of rivalry going on. 
Yeah, and uh, Jack Kelly is also in this, besides Leslie Nielsen. Yeah. So if you're an old Maverick fan, then there's Bart Maverick for you. And Richard Anderson, who wound up uh, the $6 million man's uh, mentor and also played the president in umpteen movies. Uh, Earl Holloman plays the chef, which, by the way, the original script apparently didn't have that character. And Could when the be. studio bought it, they said, we have to have some comic relief, guys. It can't all be this grim sci-fi stuff. So he was put in to be the comic relief, and he's the one who talks Robbie the Robot, the very first robot of that type, who, if you've seen Lost in Space, you've seen his cousin, because the same guy made both of them. He talks Robbie into synthesizing booze for him. 60 <laughs> gallons of it. Yes. <laughs> was it Kentucky Bourbon, I think, wasn't it? Or Yes. <laughs> so... Well, anyway, so uh, thank you for that summary, and um, I think we can continue on with saying that after a while, it becomes apparent that there is more going on on this planet than meets the eye. Um, Morbius, for someone who is trying to keep a secret, is very, very forthright and uh, upfront and um, uh, open in showing Leslie Nielsen and uh, Doc the 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 mysteries and and the wonders of Krell and. What I think is still a fantastic special effects sequence where he takes you into like the sort of labyrinthian workings of this alien species. And it's like it's like something out of one of those Marvin the Martian cartoons, right? Like, it, But at the same time, seeing it on screen again, it holds up remarkably well. And in, in a world where all of us on this channel talk about budgets and all, they made this movie for $1.9 million back in 1956. Wow. Uh, it looks much bigger than that. And what's amazing to me is how much of the stuff they built got used and reused and reused. Uh, if you're trying to imagine what we're talking about, because you haven't seen the film as far as the bowels of the planet with these massive machines, uh, try and remember the beginnings of the time tunnel when they walk mm -hmm. through all those underground things, or for that matter, to some degree, um, Andromeda strain. The actual spaceship, this saucer-shaped ship C-57D, was later used in seven different episodes of The Twilight Zone. So were a lot of the props, the crew uniforms. Uh, this stuff got recycled forever. And by the way, these beautiful gardens that surround Morbius's uh, home, they're all recycled from Munchkinland because it's the same st studio and the same stage that they made The Wizard of Oz on 19 years before. <laughs> yeah, and to kind of give you uh, an example of some of this stuff, if you haven't seen the movie, there's an awful lot of uh, uh, what amounts to uh, similar to uh, plate photography, where you have these beautiful vistas that were created essentially by animators or, or artists that look like Frank Frazetta paintings. If you've ever seen any of the old sci-fi magazines, yeah. it looks exactly like that. Some beautiful artwork. It's not realistic. Per se, but it is impressionistic of what you could imagine it looked like. For the and, time that this movie came out, it had some of the most impressive special effects ever. And speaking of animators, MGM, which once had its own animation department, had by that time totally shut it down, and they had to go outside. And where did they go? Well, Disney. you'll find that there's a guy named Joshua Meter, who was one of the classic Disney animators and who appears in the billing as through the courtesy of Walt Disney Productions, who animated not just the what we find is eventually this creature that I won't go into too much to spoil it, but all the laser beams and other special effects were all coming out of his creativity. So there's a Disney link, too, as if you needed more reason to see it. It's also, this is an irritation a bit in the movie for me, although it's a small one. It leans very heavy into the theremin throughout the entire picture. So. Well, now that's interesting too, because David Rose, who was a very famous movie scorer, originally was signed to do the music, but apparently the producer, the head of MGM, Dory Sherry, was in some nightclub in Greenwich Village, and these two electronic musicians, Lewis and B.B. Barron, were playing, and he said, that's what we need in my movie, and it's not listed in the credits as the score, it's listed as electronic tonalities. And this was back in the 50s, right? 1956, so yeah. It's wild. And I mean, I, I got to agree with Lauren on this one. Um, the music, well, such as it is, like, I, I, you know what? After we talked, Lou, I went and I read the x-rays on Amazon when I rented the film, or bought the film, rather. 
Yeah. And I did see the part where they said that a rough cut with all of those sort of electronic weird sounds was shown to audiences. They loved it so much that they just decided to go full throttle with it, and not even create the score. Um, it does um, add to the eeriness and strangeness. It perhaps detracts from the majesty. You yeah. Can imagine, you can imagine what a really great musical score would have done to those scenes of all of that Krell technology and to those vistas of that scary planet. There should uh, have been a bit more balance, I think. Yeah. I think the main problem that I have with it is that sometimes it feels to me like the audio mix has it elevated too high. It gets too loud, but it is very alien. And, and yeah. you really do get the impression that this is, you're certainly not on Earth. It, it, it transports you someplace else. And that's kind of an, it is a nice effect for that purpose. Well, just to sort of quickly uh, wrap up the, the synopsis, and I know we're going to be spoiling it a little bit, so I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, it turns out that part of the Krell technology includes a machine that can enhance your IQ. And so Morbius is the one who um, zapped up his brain power. And there's a very interesting point where he gets into an argument with um, Leslie Nielsen and uh, the Doc character, Warren Stevens, about how you know they're saying rightfully so that this should be shared with the rest of society and we have to get this back to HQ and we need all sorts of scientists here and whatnot. And, uh, Morbius replies that no, no, with the, the human humanity is not ready to 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 um, to to have this technology. Like it's it would be just dis disastrous. And so he had set himself up as the sort of the final arbiter of what he might share and what he might not share with with humanity. There, there's an important part before this though, and it goes into when he's first showing off the Krell technology after. Essentially, they come to question him because they're becoming more suspicious of Morbius. So he takes them down below where his homestead has been located to show them these vistas of technology and, and all the wondrous things that the Krell created. Now, they have become a little bit suspicious because he has Robbie the Robot, for example, all of these wondrous technologies that he should not be able to create and they don't know where it came from. He's a philologist. He is a, a character who studies languages. And what um, Morbius reveals down below is that he found these alien ruins, including examples of their writing, and was able to translate it to, to put together a history of what happened to the Krell. And what the Krell were doing was working towards some advanced project that was going to involve their entire society, including no longer needing to deal uh, with the physical to control uh, their machines or anything else, that, that they were going to elevate themselves beyond that. To be pure and, intelligence beings rather than physical beings, which is, again, a plot that we've seen through science fiction ever since. Some might call it a singularity. And going beyond, the, uh, if you're talking about the Star Trek references as well, we see examples of essentially a replicator. Uh, there's the acceleration compensators that you were talking about earlier that are directly the, uh, the, the, oh, yeah. Uh, the yeah, they, they are the, no doubt the inspiration for the transporters. But we're also talking about transporting matter in these technologies that the Krell were creating as well. What Morbius reveals is that they had been building to this this ascension of their entire society when all of the Krell suddenly vanished in what amounts to one night. This whole entire civilization was destroyed a million years ago, and all of their great works, except for the things that were underground, crumbled to dust where Morbius eventually found them. And... I don't know. Do we really care about spoilers at this point? No, for no. Let's just, let's just do it. The, the other interesting thing, you have to remember the 50s was the golden age of, ah, psychology and psychiatry and all of that. Scientology. What they, what they realize is that what this monster that starts devastating their crew and attacks them is, is the id, the, the inner angst and, and attitude of Morbius himself. Uh, that that's what, how the Krell self-destructed is they released the thing inside them that is the most primitive, that is the most uh, violent, uh, and it took over and, des and destroyed things. Yeah, in trying to elevate their own intelligences and elevate themselves beyond the physical, they didn't take into account that there is a subconscious that you're not completely aware of. And so what destroyed their society, it happened in one night, and they didn't even know what killed them. Now Morbius has used their machine, he has raised his own intelligence, and he has succumbed to the same thing, 
not realizing himself that he is responsible for the deaths of all of the other crew members. This is why he was immune, is that it was his subconscious mind essentially dealing with anything that frustrated him. And this is that whole, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for aspect of this whole thing, because he wanted knowledge and understanding and control, and he didn't realize that he wasn't able to control it either. Just uh, his, this thing where they want him to give the technology to Earth, no, no, I'll decide what's good enough for the rest of the world because they won't understand it. I'm superior. Yeah, And it's once sure they start are. pressing him that the, the, the monster begins to appear. Uh, Those who until... the gods would destroy, they first make arrogant bastards. Uh... <laughs> and for the sake of the, uh, the audience listening, it literally is a monster that is created by the Krell machinery. It, they, it draws upon um, the power of basically like geothermal power from the planet or all the, the nuclear reactors. It's this... This monster that shouldn't exist. In, and it's, in, it's invisible, but they set invisible. up a kind of a force field protection for the spaceship, and it plows right through it. Yeah. And, and you see its footprints, but not it. And later they make a casting of the footprint, and it's this giant clawed foot of this. Like a raptor foot. Yeah. And when you actually see it in uh, the Disney animator's uh, vision of it, just as a kind of a blue static outline, it bears a remarkable resemblance to my eye to the Night on Bald Mountain sequence of uh, Fantasia uh, to that horned devil figure, that big muscular bullheaded oh, yeah. thing. I, I always thought that it looked like, do you remember in the Marvin the Martian cartoons, the big oh, yeah. hairy alien? The, yeah. always, the red one with running shoes. Yeah, I always thought it looked like that. Yeah, I got that vibe from it too. <laughs> that's one of the interesting things though, is that because the monster is invisible, all that you ever see is its outline when it's being blasted either by a force field or by their blasters. So you never actually see it. But when they do make that plaster cast that Lou was talking about, they examine it and they, they make reference to the fact that this foot doesn't make sense. It has all of these different attributes of different types of creatures. Parts of it are mammalian, parts of it are bird, parts of it are reptile. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an amalgam, of course, of all of the creatures, good and evil, in Morbius's brain. It, it, it's, it's literally a nightmare creature. That's why it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, at any rate, uh, Morbius discovers the shocking truth, um, heroically sacrifices himself, I guess you could say, and uh, basically sets the self-destruct on the planet. Um, the rest of the crew, the captain, the, uh, the, the beautiful Anne Francis, they're all able to escape and watch as Altair IV basically vaporizes itself. A happy ending. A happy ending. <laughs> well, a cautionary one anyway. <laughs> well, and, and of course, that's the point. Uh, this film, because it was for its time for what they were doing, expensive, even with all this recycling of things afterwards and before, uh, basically broke even, came in a little bit under. And some say that it was Dory Sherry greenlighting this as the head of MGM, this thing that wasn't in any way, shape, or form what they expected an MGM movie to be. That's why he shortly after that got fired as the head of the studio. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. This is a classic movie. And, and when you look at all the other things that came from this, and I'm not talking just you know many, many years later, uh, uh, Star Trek, but so many, well, I mentioned all those Twilight Zone episodes, but mm -hmm. Outer Limits, Twilight Zone, all of the sci-fi movies that came after, uh, they all started here, folks. This is where people, if, if MGM was making it for big bucks, suddenly you had to take this genre seriously, and before that, nobody did. This, this was the prototypical science fiction movie. Like, I mean, you can find bits of everything in there. Like... I can just imagine Gene Roddenberry in the theater looking at this thinking, man, that saucer, I should add a bunch of lollipop sticks to the back of that thing. And I think that would make a great spaceship. Like you, you, <laughs> you literally could see where so much of Star Trek came from, like the, the green desolate planets that they beamed down to in this TV show. Um, Even the little pips on the uniform. Uh, yeah shoulders were different colors based on what kind of a soldier they were engineering or security or whatever the the uniform is one of the things i wanted to call out about the show because honestly even though the effects are dated 
those uniforms don't look all that far off from something that you would see on Enterprise. They would still oh. hold up at a sci-fi show today. And, you know, the effects, I, again, like, granted that I know that a lot of the, um, the effects were hand-drawn. They're, they're basically a, a blending of animation with, with live action, but they're still pretty darn good. Like, with the scene where the monster is attacking... And you know they're shooting it, and it turns red like the Marvin the Martian thing. But uh, yeah. and the, you know like they they pick up like it picks up one of the crew members and whatnot. Like it's it it's really well done. Like, and about those scenes, it's real interesting because for audiences that are used to let's say war movies or gangster movies or anything else where firearms or cannons are shot, you know there's no smoke, there's no projectiles. It's these big cannons they've got to protect the ship are basically a big square with four lines of blue static coming out of them and unifying at the point where they hit the bad guy. Yeah, it, you yeah. have a different sound. You have a different feel to it than the big impacts and explosions that you expect in a scene like that. that it just that adds is, to the alienness of the whole situation. I, no I recoil to any of the blasters. That, yeah. That's something that I didn't like too much because, I mean, without... It, it did feel very underwhelming whenever any of those uh, weapons were, were shot. And so he, maybe that adds to the fact that um, the monster basically just shrugged it off like nothing. I think it's funny, too, in all the world of high tech, whatever, the uniform word they use to refer to the weapons is, oh, it's a blaster. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> How many actual locations are there in the movie? I think it's only about five. You've got the interior of the ship. You've got yep. the exterior of the ship. You've got the little grotto where Cookie was cooking up all of his uh, uh, liquor. You have the exterior of uh, Morbius's house. And then you have the interior. And I guess you could kind and of... And then the Krell uh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's fairly economical in that sense. And that it's there's not a whole lot of locations. Especially when all the plants are, are leftover munchkin plants. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this could have basically all been filmed on a back lot, right? It was all on one stage, I'm sure. Yeah. Maybe two. Maybe two. Okay. Nothing exterior for real on this movie. None at all. Except for the tiger. Even the tiger. If you look real <laughs> close, he's not there at the same time she is, by the way. I know. I know. I noticed that. that um, you and if you, watch, if you watch one of those things in the x-ray, but I saw it even before they mentioned it, when Robbie picks up uh, uh, one of the guy's bodies, uh, Robbie can't lift that guy. So there's wires holding the man in his arms so that uh, the weight is compensated for. But and, He can uh, hold about 10 tons worth of lead, though. Well, there is that, except it's not lead. It's some isotope. It only weighs 50 pounds. And I, then, you know, these, these anal retentive fact-check morons on Amazon. Well, but if that actual isotope was real, it would be heavier than lead, not lighter. Not going, that Go one. away. There's too much of this stuff. <laughs> I do have to say that Robbie, the the voice of Robbie, really, um, really Martin stole Miller. The Marvin Miller. Like, Marvin Miller, who, if you've ever seen an old TV show that maybe we'll touch on in some other discussion of another genre, uh, The Millionaire. Yeah. You know, he, he was the representative of The Millionaire. Um, and he did all kinds of uh, uh, announces and voiceovers in those days. Like, I mean, the dry... If you couldn't get Paul Fries, you got him. The dry humor... Um, just the, the the humanity he gave to that sort of thing. I think it, it was again the prototype for stuff like C three PO. I would argue, um, including the number of languages that he spoke. Although it's far true. fewer than six million. That's true. That's true. Um, and even the 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 guy who created Robbie, uh, who I believe is a, is a Japanese, I can't remember. Robert Kinoshita, yeah. Kinoshita, he also created the um, the robot in Lost in Space. Right. And apparently there was a, a meeting between both Robbie and that robot. A couple of crossover episodes of Lost in Space, I believe. Yeah. Wow, I, I got to go back and check those out. Does Robbie still exist? Do we know? Yes, yes, it does. Uh, I know where you've seen it. If you hadn't thought about it. It makes a brief appearance in the movie, I think it's the second FX movie, as being one of the props in his workshop. But it said somewhere that there's some producer who actually owns it. So, uh, Did he, I don't remember if it was the Lost in Space robot or if it was Robbie. There was one that appears briefly in the background in Gremlins. Do you remember that? Might have been. Might have been Robbie there too, because of course he was a big fan of all these old films. All right, so I've got it here. Uh, originally, it was sold to someone by the name of William Malone, 
and um, William alone was able to carefully restore the robot. Um, he had it for about 25 years. The original Robbie the Robot remained in his props collection for many years until finally being sold by Bonham's Auctioneers in New York on November ah. 21st, 2017 for $5.3 million. <laughs> Robbie became the most expensive film prop ever sold at auction. Wow. Who Doesn't say. Um, A fan. I, I thought I'd, I I thought I'd read that it was some producer who had it as well. Yeah, um, it's an amazing prop. I mean, even today, remember this movie was made sixty seven years ago, and yet Robbie, despite the fact that it's obviously a fifties robot, still looks amazing. Uh, it, All it the little clicking, up. flashing, wiggling things on the surface are pretty damned amazing. Oh, guys. Even the, you're the, gonna the lines what he's speaking, yeah. Yes. You're going to love this. So when you look at some of the uh, the places where Robbie's appeared after that, he was in um, a television commercial for AT&T back in 2006, <laughs> along with WOPR Kit and Rosie the Robot Maid. Ah. And he was, in the the big, he was in the Big Bang Theory in 2014. And then finally in Duck Dodgers, season one, episode three, cartoonized as Agent Roboto. Is there a Duck Dodgers cartoon in 2017? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Really? Oh, gosh. Yeah. And he's also in Earth Girls Are Easy. <laughs> and Gremlins. Yes, Gremlins. There you go. Yep. Well, so, of course, what we should mention is the larger, again, impact that this yes, had. Yes, yes. It, it gave a level, level of legitimacy to something that was, as we talked about in our last episode, a pulp thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I once heard... Uh, Ray Bradbury try and explain the difference between science fiction and fantasy. And he said, in fantasy, a guy's being chased by the bad guy and he runs up a dead end alley and he waves a wand and passes a magic spell and walks through the wall. In science fiction, he's being chased by the guy up the same alley, but he pulls out a machine that discombobulates his atoms and transports them to the other side of the wall. So it's, there's a very fine line there between the two genres. Okay. It's just the implication of technology being involved whether it's to, as I said, uh, create Frankenstein's monster or whether it's Robbie the Robot. Any sufficiently advanced technology will appear to be magic. There yeah. you go. But, I mean, I think the other thing, too, is that science fiction, the difference between science fiction and fantasy as you know, at a general level is the premise that science fiction, however improbable, could be possible, whereas magic is just, you know, uh, I mean, so I guess some people believe in magic and Fair, fair play to them, but it's not something that you can eventually well, aspire it, it could, to. It could maybe happen, but you couldn't explain it the way you can. Yeah. Just remember, everything in this movie is perfectly well explained. That doesn't it's make true. it any less fantastic, yeah. but it gives you a reason why they died, a reason why they built this technology, a reason why everything that happens happens. It may not be a, a reason we can relate to in the real world, but at least it has a, its own internal logic. The opening of the movie is something that has always stuck with me since the first time that I saw it, because it's the first time that I think I saw science fiction uh, of this uh, vintage that looked like it was really taking the science part seriously. When yeah. they are uh, initially coming out of hyperspace and preparing to enter the atmosphere of Altair IV, and they reorient the ship to make sure they don't skip off the atmosphere, all of that, you know, it's a minor thing. But they weren't just treating it as though hand-waving, oh, we're just going to land on the planet. They were showing that there's a process to this, and it's very technical, and it needs to be done correctly. And, and yet, they didn't envision the wireless microphone. <laughs> yeah. Every, even yeah. when they're on the planet and they're talking back to the ship, they pull it out of their belt, and there's a cord attached to something <laughs> on a little reel. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, but I, I like the fact that they... This is the first time that I think I ever saw the, the science part emphasized in a science fiction picture. Uh, and it was also being run with military precision. You know, this was a military ship. And you had yeah. people that were actually doing specific jobs the way that you would on any type of a military vessel. And so that, that was also kind of interesting. It was very much a submarine in space. And... and Normally, when you see a flying saucer, you assume that this is going to be an alien ship. I thought it was yep. interesting that they used this to, that no, this is just how we did it. <laughs> yep. And the majority of the audience in 1956, between World War II and Korea, would have had some kind of military experience, at least the men. 
Oh, and so they had a way to identify with these guys saying, well, that's like my platoon or my ship or whatever, that maybe modern audiences don't have as much. That's a really good point, actually. Yeah. No, no, I hadn't even thought about that. Wow. Well, it, it's uh, – and again, you, you, you see the, the sort of the prototype of the Federation, the United Federation of Planets – in the beginning of the the movie in just the way that you know it, it, their their ship is like a proto starfleet essentially um uh, that's it, why it's, it's got a number for a name there's obviously a bunch of others with sequential numbers leading up to that and after it and they had gravity like they had deceleration i mean deceleration transporter tube things or whatever but i mean they, to even acknowledge that i thought as lauren said they really seem to put a focus on the science I think one of the X-ray comments, um, Lou, correct me if I'm wrong, but they said that the, the the director consulted with scientists and ultimately decided that it would be the most realistic for that planet to have a green atmosphere. I'm not sure what the rationale behind it is, but uh, I think the rationale was it looks different than Earth uh, <laughs> from a purely artistic point of view, and they make point of it. Boy, I don't know about that green when they get off the ship. And the other guy says, I don't know, it's kind of pretty. Um, what it means as to the oxygen composition of the... And they make a point when they're getting ready to leave the ship of saying, guys, you won't need your environmental suits on this one. Obviously, they've been to places without an Earth atmosphere, non-type yeah. uh, M planets to use the uh, Star Trek uh, nomenclature. Uh, and Altair IV shows up as a planet in the in the Federation later, too, by the way. Uh, you know, it, it's it's... When you consider... In 1956, I don't know the exact timing on this. I could be wrong. I don't know that we knew what black holes were. I don't know that anybody had a real concept, certainly not the average movie-going person, of what light speed was or could be or whether you could do it or not. Uh, there's a lot of assumption here, and it is a, a, a tribute to the filmmakers and to the actors that they sold it without going into... I mean, the only real long, complicated explanation is Morbius explaining about the Krell and it works, and yeah. you get it, and you understand it, and you don't need a degree in psychology to understand what the id is and how they misunderstood about that. Uh, it's some really, really good storytelling, and it's knowing what not to say. If they had stopped the whole movie to spend 25 minutes explaining to you about what light speed was, you'd be gone already. Uh, but they knew they didn't have to. They knew they could sell it. Something else I want to talk about briefly, if we can, Lou, you're, you're going to be great for this, I think, <laughs> is that Morbius is played by Walter Pidgeon. Yes. And he has an amazing voice. Oh, yeah. Uh, and if, if you ever listen to old Disney stuff, you'll know his voice from a few things as well. But w what do you take from the casting of Walter Pidgeon for the role of Morbius? Well, of course, the whole story is The Tempest, is Shakespeare's Tempest. Yeah, and Prospero. Prospero. And so uh, I wonder, it'd be interesting to know if he ever played that part in his theatrical days. Uh, he was also, let's not forget, the original, before they got Basehart to do the TV series, he was Admiral Nelson in the original movie version of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Uh, it's that his voice and his demeanor have an authority about them. Yep. If he says it, it must be true. And the fact that he's the guy who misunderstands, he's the guy who thinks he knows everything and it turns out he knows nothing at all, you got to have somebody who can sell that authority in order to make that switch work. Uh, he's a wonderful actor. I think it really says something that when they first arrive on Altair and he tries to warn them off, he tries to get them to go away, but when they insist on landing, he gives them the coordinates, he meets them, and he tries to kind of, let's have lunch, I'll tell you what happened then. <laughs> gives them lunch. Here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but the, the funny thing is, is that even though you get a vibe that there's something off about Morbius, you still kind of buy into everything that he's saying when he starts talking about the Krill. You know he's an intelligent individual. Yeah. And and there's this tragedy built into the role because his intentions are all benevolent. You know, he, he didn't he didn't know that he was the cause of all of this. He was just as bewildered as anybody else. But because of his hubris, all of these people were killed, and, and he ultimately pays a price for it. And, and I think you have to be very careful about how you play a role like that to be somebody who is arrogant, but intelligent and capable and even sympathetic. That's not easy to pull off. And then displays, you know, humility at the end of it. 
Yeah. You know, it's interesting that he's associated with another science movie. He got an Academy Award nomination for his role in Madame Curie. Oh. Walter I didn't Pitchett know that. Did. I just looked it up because I was curious. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> so, born in St. John, Canada in 1897, died in the town I was born, Santa Monica, 1984. Wow. wow. Canadian. All right. Yeah. yeah. So. Can you imagine? That's an interesting span of time to oh, have. Uh, I mean, and to be starring in a science fiction movie. You know, in the opening, when they're talking about where this movie is taking place, it's taking place after 2200. They, they, they talk about how at the end of the 21st century, man landed on the moon uh, at the end of the 21st. And so they, they didn't quite foresee that they were going to get there a lot earlier. Uh, they now, now, Lauren, there. we know that that was faked. Come on. <laughs> 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 but but I take your point, you know, he was born in the 1800s and he sort of, you know, capped off his career in a film about the far future. He started out in silence, for God's sakes, in 1926 like, and 27. Like light speed computers. Uh, like, well, how wild it, is that? <laughs> I, I think like Lou said at the beginning, it's like the first science fiction story, Frankenstein. But... There were others very shortly after that. You had the time machine. You know, you had the War of the Worlds. Those yes, were all written yes. in that prototypical era. You had Jules Verne, which yep. Doc Brown was inspired by. You know, so um, it goes back further than a lot of people think. I think, and I think that's also sort of where the charm and appeal of the the uh, steampunk genre comes from. Is that that's that subset of what if things had happened the way that they imagined it in the late eighteen hundreds if things had gone more steam powered than electric when so on that so when was frankenstein was written when it was uh 1818 okay because uh, there was the american uh, connecticut yankee in king arthur's court was 1889 so yeah yeah okay. yeah bought it um gosh 1818 can you believe that and i believe it was it i think it was frankenstein where it was uh, Mary Shelley and her paramour and a bunch of others that were together for like a retreat. And they all sort of made bets about who could write the spookiest story. I think that's how that went. I don't remember. It could uh, be. Yeah, I, I, I think that was how that story came about, was that they were all, they challenged each other to write ghost stories. And yes, that's right, that's right, that's uh, right, that's right. I'm looking at an interesting story that Walter Pidgeon told. He says, I was called to Louis B. Mayer's office to discuss a long-term contract he wanted me to sign. He told me he'd been impressed by my work at other studios and felt I would be an asset to MGM. He peered at me over his glasses and suggested I tell him about myself. I started by saying I came from New Brunswick. That's in Canada, I added. I know where New Brunswick is, said Mayer. See, Mayer was born there, but he didn't know that. He said, where in New Brunswick were you born? He said, St. John. And Mayor jumped to his feet and thumped on his desk. He said, young man, you can't influence me with lies like that. Who told you to say you came from St. John? <laughs> he said, I finally quieted him down and convinced him I really was from St. John. I had to tell him where half a dozen streets and buildings were that he remembered. But I left his office with a contract for much more money than I expected, and we were friends <laughs> till the day he died. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Well, you know, so... Here's something else that I'm amazed by with this film. The fact that we haven't seen a remake or a reboot or a modernization of it. Yes. Why do you guys think that is? I think it would be hard to do it justice. Um, but that's never stopped any of the students I, I, before. I, I know, but I also think that, that there may be a feeling amongst the studios that how do you pull off that id ending without it coming off corny at the time that the movie was made this is as lou said when psychiatry was really coming into vogue and they were playing with a lot of different ideas that i don't know if all of those would still hold up the same way today and those were ideas about psychology that were new to the audience now it's right. like oh what that again yeah it's true You'd have to come up with another another resolution, and I don't know that any other resolution works as well as the one that's in this film. You know, something that was interesting about this was that I was watching the movie with my son, who's 14, and I really wanted him to see this movie because he's about the same age that I was when I first saw it, I think. He was actually quite riveted by it, which I, I sort of 
I wasn't sure if he would be. I was afraid that he might think that it was a little too old fashioned. Uh, he did start to fall asleep in the middle of it, though, because he was warm and comfortable. And so I poked him several times and I said, pay attention to this part. You're going to want to see. <laughs> at, at, at the very end of it, he didn't. He, he was kind of not getting what was going on. He was very confused. And I paused it for a moment and he didn't know what the id was. And so I had to explain it to him and he nodded and I kept going. Uh, we started the movie again and then suddenly he sat bolt upright and he said that's what killed the Krell and and it suddenly all fell into place for him because he, he hadn't quite gotten that at that point and he was electrified after that and so in that sense it does still hold up uh, and I think that's that's what makes it a special movie and by the way I cannot imagine if this same plot was on Star Trek Kirk ever using the word id, they would have said something about the inner fury that's inside all of us, the animal instinct that we can't control, and left it at that. But giving it that name right out of, you know, Freud and Jung and well, all the rest of it. textbook, yeah. It, it, it's too on the nose for modern audiences, and it, it worked then because it was all new. Now, I, I just want to put this proposition out there. If it was... Um, uh, Beyonce in the starring role of Morbius, <laughs> who was talking about the id, I think she could sell it. With a song. Yeah. <laughs> and some snappy choreography. Uh, but go going back to Would have made an interesting sparky <laughs> outline coming through the, uh, through the uh, laser uh, guard around the ship, that's for sure. There you go. <laughs> but going back to what you were saying, though, Lauren, about uh, your, your son... Um, Last time we, we did one of these, we were talking about sort of the classic pulp heroes, and uh, we, we talked about the Phantom and the Shadow. I, so I, I was saying before about how my son actually, like my, my seven-year-old, actually was really interested in the Shadow, uh, sorry, in the Phantom when we were watching it. And it was one of the first times, like, he's expressed any sort of interest in, I guess, prototypical superhero movies. I mean, I, he, he just has no interest in marvel or dc or anything like that and i started showing him the shadow again uh particularly the part on the bridge when when uh, alec baldwin makes his first appearance and he was again he was just riveted by it and i'm kind of sitting there looking i'm like what the heck like you know one time is a flu two times like you know there, there really is something to these these older films and these older these concepts and i would say it's almost like it's almost primal really mm -hmm. I, well, I think it really is. And and as I said when we talked about those the pulp genre, the guys that wrote these stories, I mean before the movies and before the TV shows, they got paid by the word. And as many as they could churn out, it was science fiction, fine. It was gangsters, fine. It was superheroes, fine. Um, and that kind of practice leads to expertise or you're gone. Um, we, we always uh, recently make jokes about these... Uh, supposedly young, inexperienced people who are suddenly making all these multi-million dollar flops, uh, they didn't serve their apprenticeship. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't get to fail on anything other than a multi-billion dollar disaster. Um, <laughs> and that's not good. That's, that's the, they might be good someday if they ever got those opportunities, but it's gone. It's how over. You, how do you even end up in a situation like that? Like, I just don't get it. Uh. Lou, if you ever have any any insight into that, I, I think everyone in, in would a situation. To do that. Be, tell me more. What situation? You mean being like in, a, in a situation where you're suddenly you're you're obviously someone inexperienced who hasn't cut their teeth, who hasn't you know had the chance to be. Well, in the case of the current crop, it's because the powers that be want them that way because they figure they're malleable and they're manipulatable and they're controllable, uh. and uh, so you know. And on the other hand. There is a level of hubris involved. Uh, I've worked with people who moved up to directing from other jobs and suddenly thought they knew how because my name is on the, the call sheet as a director and they're paying me all this money. I must know how. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, again, hubris. It's the same thing we're talking about, about uh, Morbius. Uh, <laughs> It's, it, in fact, it's very similar to that, if you think about it. Uh, it's this guy who is a brilliant, wonderful genius who misses the obvious. And uh, we see a lot of that in politics and in, in all kinds of things, don't we? So I, I hope this means that eventually we're going to hear Iger say, I deny you. I give you up. 
Well, you you heard <laughs> you heard the line. I mentioned it uh, in another show, but I read it uh, in an article recently, where the guy summed up the whole situation as. The guy who jumped into It's a Small World Naked was on drugs. What's Iger's excuse? <laughs> so, you know, he's supposed to know better. <sighs> and it isn't just because his name is on the door and he gets his own shower. Uh, he has an obligation to live up to his own hype. And yeah. uh, he's instead a legend in his own mind. Well, so. like, like Morbius, he has given rise to this monster that he thought that he could control. And I don't think he has any control over the studio in an appreciable way anymore, really. Uh, his talent is able to revolt, and, and that's a dangerous position. Well, to be in. but wait a minute. They're not revolting. They're going along with everything he told them to do and approved oh, of. Yeah. Oh, I beg to differ. They are definitely revolting. Well, really? <laughs> <laughs> what a revolt and development. Um, <laughs> Well, guys, on that note, I think uh, I think we could wrap up this convo. Um, what we had discussed to audience, if you're interested, uh, and please let us know your comments down below, of course, was to continue on in the sci-fi genre, going in to talk about things like Buck Rogers, uh, Battlestar Galactica, Blake beedy, Seven, beedy, beedy. all of those those classic <laughs> sci-fi shows that don't start with Star and end with Trek or or the like. So um, you know. Keep your eyes out for those. And, of course, we're going to be going off into other uh, genres as well, especially leading up into uh, Christmas time. Lou, I think you had a very good suggestion there. Oh, well, uh, if you like Christmas movies, you might want to read my article on that Park Place. They're re-releasing Die Hard. In fact, this week, I believe it is. And that's, you know, I'm, I don't care what anybody says. That's a Christmas movie, by golly. There you uh, go. <laughs> Guys, any, any sort of final comments? Ah, uh, the future. Ah, here's the great quote. Do any of you remember back in the days of, you know, the Ed Sullivan show and things like that, there was a guy named Criswell who was kind of, he actually shows up in some of Ed Wood's movies, but he was a, a soothsayer. And he came on, Criswell predicts. And he had a great line. He said, I believe in the future because that's where you and I will spend the rest of our lives. Ah. Well, that's why people went to see these things. It's like they thought it was right around the corner. Uh, and yeah. we learn in the course of Disneyland, oh, you build a Tomorrowland, that's good for about 10 or 12 years. Then you got to redo it because tomorrow catches up with you. So I think the core of science fiction is we're both fascinated and afraid of what the future might hold. And the balance between those two, if done well, can be great drama. Yeah, I don't know how to top that, Lauren. You, you give it a try. No, I'm, I, I'm not even going to try. I'm, I'm just going to say if you haven't seen this movie and you like science fiction, it is definitely worth a watch. It's oh, yeah. one that I saw when I was about 14 as well. And when I saw it, it absolutely blew my mind. Uh, if you have not seen the movie before, I'm a little sorry that we spoiled it for you because I think that surprise is worth it. But if it gets you into the, the seat to watch it, do it. Yes. Don't, and don't and be don't, put off. Don't assume because it's families. 1956 that it's old and stodgy. No, yeah. it's not. It absolutely is not. I'm actually surprised they got a, uh, a, away with some of the stuff they did with the Hayes Code being in place. They, oh, golly. Uh, was... uh, watch it for Anne Francis and no other reason. Uh, <laughs> long before she was Honey West, she was a honey. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think on that note, we're going to say uh, adieu, uh, and we will talk to you soon. Guys, thank you again for this wonderful conversation. Um, and, you know, audience, let us know what you thought. Do you have any comments? Have you seen the film? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Uh, would you recommend it to, to other people? Are there other films in this area that you think might be more... Uh, influential than Forbidden Planet was. Tell us why. Leave your comments down below. Like this is this is this is what we live for. We love to hear this interaction and this feedback. So drop us a line, okay? And uh, we'll see you on the next genre, guys. We hope you enjoyed that special presentation of the genre guys here on T3PO. Be sure to subscribe to this channel for more content like it. And if you want to enjoy episodes of the genre guys as soon as they are released, be sure to become a member at WW Pro's YouTube channel. What were your thoughts on this amazing topic? Let us know in the comments below. And thank you for joining us here on T3PO.
Please comment, like, and share this video. And don't forget to subscribe to That Park Place Podcasts Online, your source for exclusive content and highlights from WDW Pro, The Pro Show, and That Park Place for all the news that should be fun.